Okay, so good afternoon everybody. I'm Elisabetta Iossa, the coordinator of the Master of Science in European Economy and Business Law. And I wish to welcome you all at this uh, second alumni uh, event of uh, EBL. So we are here connected uh, online in streaming. This is uh, exciting. Um, uh, I'm happy that the University of Rome Tor Vergata reacted uh, very quickly and uh, efficiently uh, by moving all lectures, events and meetings online. So we are experiencing our uh, first uh, alumni day online. It might not be the last because actually this has helped us uh, to get uh, a lot of uh, really uh, interesting speakers. Uh, the purpose of the Alumni Day, uh, which we introduced at Tor Vergata, we were actually the first, uh, together with the Master of Science and Economics, at, at thinking about this event, is really to um, try to put together uh, our current students with the former students, uh, Alumni Day, and with uh, people from the business sector or institutions who can come and uh, share their experience uh, uh, and um, their experience uh, and maybe even uh, give some advice or inform about uh, uh, opportunities. Um, the idea is uh, to create, uh, to facilitate the exchange, exchange of information and also uh, to give uh, current students um, ideas as to what could come next. Uh, I'm happy to say that uh, um, the past event was quite successful. Uh, opportunities for internships or job applications followed the event and the network is slowly uh, but thoroughly building up. So let me now welcome our speakers. I'm very thankful for uh, uh, their being here. So the um, first person will be uh, Alfredo Macchiati. I wish to thank Alfredo who will be our first presenter. And I will tell you a little bit about uh, his background for the moment. Let me just uh, uh, welcome Alfredo Macchiati, Marco Sebastiani. Riccardo Madrigali, they will give us uh, their the business presentations and then we have uh, our alumni Rita De Santis Bruno, Lorenzo Migliaccio and Gabriele Silvestri. The, um, the idea of the, this meeting is that first uh, um, we will have uh, th the three business presentations. The speakers will share their screen. They have kindly prepared some presentation PowerPoints uh, sharing with us their experience and opportunities uh, at workplace. Uh, the people who would like to ask questions uh, should uh, feel free to do so. Uh, uh, there will be, uh, I will pause uh, for a, a couple of minutes at the end of the presentation of a speaker and that may be the best time for, for uh, the audience to ask questions. Um, so um, I will tell you also a little bit about uh, the speakers. So let us start with um, Alfredo Macchiati. I'm really thankful for uh, being here. So Alfredo is currently director of Oxira. Uh, Oxira is one of the main uh, economic consultancy firms and we've had the students already applying for positions there because they, they, as you will see, they do very interesting work. Uh, he is an expert on regulation and competition in infrastructure, energy and transport sector, and I've also had the pleasure to work with him in the past on an infrastructure project. So Alfredo's professional experience encompasses research and analysis of regulation and competition for institutions such as CONSOB, and the Autorità Garante della Concorrenza e del Mercato, the Italian Antitrust Authority, and for firms such as Enel and Ferrovie dello Stato. From 2011 to 2015, he was Director General of Casa Conguaglio per il, for the energy sector and the uh, Italian Clearing House of the Electricity and Gas Sector. 
He was subsequently senior advisor at the infrastructure investor uh, Casa Depositi e Prestiti Rete, where he advised on regulation and antitrust issues. Alongside his work in business, Alfredo has taught at several Italian universities, including uh, our university, University of Bologna, Tuscia University, and Lewis. Where, uh, um, and where he currently uh, leads the economic policy course in the Department of Political Science. Um, so Alfredo graduated in Rome, uh, not at Tor Vergata Bella Sapienza, and he then joined the research department of the Bank of Italy and completed his training at Northwestern University. Um, so thank you again, Alfredo, for being here, and I'm very excited uh, of this opportunity to really have the director of Xira Rome office here with us. And thank you, Elisabetta, for introducing me. And thanks for the invitation, which gives me the opportunity to introduce Oxera and what Oxera does in the economic consultancy market. Uh, I have prepared a slide deck. I hope to be able, since I am a little bit uh, digitally literate, uh, to transpose the presentation on the screen. Let, let's check if it works. Uh, <coughs> So while, while Alfredo prepares the slides, I find in these days that it's quite interesting because uh, uh, I don't know, but uh, my experience is that uh, uh, really there is a variety of platforms, not a dominant one at the moment, from Zoom, Microsoft Team, GoToMeeting, uh, Google Meet, <laughs> so the, the sort of uh, uh, competition Meet, among platforms in, in this regard is not too bad. Maybe some help will be will be useful because now I'm a little bit lost. If somebody could remind okay. me, okay, uh, for about. the sharing. So on the uh, you should see a bar in the middle of the screen. Ah, okay. With yes, the, with yes, the, yes, yes, okay. yes. Now for the, yes. Yes. Well, okay. There is a little arrow going up, and that's for sharing the screen. Yes, I see it. Uh -huh. Then there is desktop, which is not finestra. Finestra, no. Well, if you if you share the desktop, then uh, then uh, you if you open the slides in the background and you share. Yes, yeah, slides are opened, but okay. Uh, 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 uh. I'm afraid you don't see it. They are in PowerPoint. Uh, yes, they are. Yes. So when you when you. OK, something is happening. Yes. Something is happening. Yes. So you see them. We see the desktop. OK, so if you open the slides, now we should be able to see. OK, What's... yes. Here we are. Yes. Oh, great. Fantastic. Uh, uh, just a second. So. It's good in a sense because you, the beginning of your presentation was scheduled for the presentation at 5.15, so we're in perfect time. We yeah. went early earlier on, so okay. now it's uh, we're spot on time. OK. Yeah. Now, how, uh, how it works? Yes, now we see your page, so project okay. example. If that's the okay. first page. OK, yeah, we, no, yeah. we now see the first page. Great. Perfect. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Oxera has been is an economics consultancy. As <clears throat> uh, it, it has been established uh, approximately 40 years ago, 
and in occasion of for the English British privatization process. So is a spin off of uh, from uh, Oxford University. Uh, so the the roots of uh, Oxera are strong, the roots and the the approach which uh, still survives after 40 years is strongly academic. So we are on the market, we are economists, we we'll try to uh, support our clients, but uh, the, the philosophy and the approach is an, an academic approach. And people, senior partners, uh, write articles on economic journal, write books, and uh, are strongly engaged in the relationship with the academic world. Uh, the sectors uh, we cover are quite uh, diversified. We follow energy, financial sectors, transports, uh, digital, and uh, <clears throat> the products, what we offer to our clients is uh, support in antitrust, impact assessment, state aid, uh, regulatory reviews, mergers and acquisition for the aspects related to the regulatory aspects of merger and acquisition. So um, mostly companies which are engaged in well, mostly utilities. Um, clients are private companies, uh, investor, investment fund, and governments and the regulators. Uh, we focus on several sectors, as I've already said, and uh, the tools we use are microeconomic theory, finance, behavioral economics, econometrics, and quantitative modeling. So uh, uh, mostly of the, of the approach and the tools are microeconomic tools. Uh, I will give you a, an example of a, a project we conducted for an association of uh, utilities companies in Italy. Uh, as um, one of the political party, which is now in the ruling coalition, has considered water as a, a sort of a common good, which must be public, means state owned or municipalities owned. Uh, actually, the sector uh, has different ownership structure. There are um, water companies which are owned by municipalities, partially or fully, and there are private or partially private companies. The idea and the law proposal, the proposal, the reform bill, was to nationalize the sector. The water service should be provided only by organization companies inside the municipalities through a specific uh, special company sort of uh, uh, organizational structure, which is called aziende speciali. Um, now the sector is regulated by an independent regulator. The idea was by the, this political party was to move the um, uh, responsibility of regulation from the independent regulator to the to the uh, political institution, the Ministry of Environment. Uh, <clears throat> other key feature of the proposed reform bill was public funding of investment, 
now the investment is partially funded or largely funded by the tariff system. So the idea was that uh, uh, to uh, leave this approach of tariff and, uh, the, and to create a public funding uh, for the water service. And another <clears throat> main block of this reform was the reduction of concession areas. Now, this company operates through concessions. There are several companies. The sector is highly fragmented, but the idea behind the proposed bill was to increase the fragmentation. Each small municipality could have its own water company, special, Azienda Speciale. So the, uh, our project, uh, the client asked to quantify the cost of this reform, to quantify the cost of this pro proposed reform, and we uh, identified two different block for the <clears throat> to assess the cost of this proposed reform. One block is the cost for the public finance. And this cost could be uh, uh, could cover several items. Uh, one is the early termination of concession contracts. I mean that water companies have to be compensated for an early termination of the concession. Uh, municipality today, now municipality gets fees, get fees from concession. If the company becomes a branch of the municipality, the municipality uh, won't get the fees anymore. So it will be less revenues for the uh, municipalities. Uh, the proposed bill wanted to increase uh, free water consumption and this as a cost for the municipality. And as I said before, uh, public investment has to be funded with public uh, finance and not covered by tariffs. This is the first stream. Then there is the second stream. What is the cost for the consumers uh, or the benefits for the consumers? And here you can see uh, 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 the various mm, items, the various costs and benefits for the consumers. Uh, at the end of the story, just to, uh, we were able to quantify the cost of the reform. And you can see in this figure, uh, in terms of billion euro, what are the cost of the different uh, items we considered? So early termination of concession, uh, lack of revenue for municipality from concession fees. We didn't can quantify transaction costs, but transaction costs are not negligible when you make a reform of this of this uh, um, uh, importance and then what are uh, the benefits or and uh, of for the uh, for, for for from this reform and we divided one off cost from ongoing costs i mean cost which will which have to be covered and sustained every year. 
So this is a, 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 a sort of project we work on the on a large database, which uh, include all the uh, all the most important companies in, uh, in in the sector, more than 200 balance sheet. So we we had to build a, a, a data set quite large and identify the items in the balance sheet which are relevant to make these estimations. So this is a sort of a project example. Uh, I would like to spend uh, just a few minutes uh, about what is our culture and what is our approach towards uh, uh, young economists. Uh, well, uh, our mm, tradition, the tradition of, of Oxira, is one of the building block is that uh, uh, we are an, an independent company, uh, trusted, respected, uh, transparent. So integrity is one of the key words in the corporate culture. Uh, then we uh, try to be to keep all the economists, there are more than 100 economists in the five or six European offices that we have in, in Europe. And uh, uh, our, our philosophy is to keep the uh, economist updated, to uh, sustain the interaction with the academic world and uh, try to be innovative in our approach. Um, then we try to be collaborative towards the client, towards the customers, and inside the company, and to make the exchange of view one of the pillar, the exchange of views between the different people inside the company, one of the pillars of our our work and then um, we try also uh, to be passionate uh, so uh, how you can join us uh, we have uh, several uh, uh, possibilities uh, obviously, you, you could find more information visiting our, our website uh, where we publish vacancies. Uh, and uh, we have uh, two or three different types of internships, summer, term time and long term. And then we have also the possibility to be selected as an economist or a financial analyst, which is the first level, the entry level for, for young economists. As I said, uh, one of the, uh, the, our approach is typically microeconomics. So a solid background in microeconomics is required. Uh, and uh, uh, advanced programming skills are also highly desirable because we make a lot of empirical applied work. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, we have several offices in Europe in Rome, in Milan, in Paris, in Amsterdam, in Berlin, in London, in Oxford. Uh, I hope I didn't forget that. Anyway, uh, so these are, uh, as I said, our website gives more information about the work we do and how we make a difference. So please do not hesitate to visit uh, the, the website. And if you have some question, 
I'll be happy to to answer your your question. Thanks for your attention. Th thank you very much, Alfredo, for this very interesting presentation. Let me. Uh, I, I'll, I'll have a question, a couple of questions for you, but uh, let me. Um, tell our audience that, uh, you know, they can really invite them uh, if they want to ask questions even on the application process or the background that is needed or any further question, just uh, unmute your microphone to give you a couple of minutes. Let me ask something to, um, to, uh, to Alfredo. So I thought the, the project you presented was extremely useful and interesting for us because it's really economic based. You know, it's this idea of uh, uh, the political um, agenda, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the informing, uh, um, uh, informing uh, politics about the cost of a proposed bill seems to be a very much a sort of uh, applied uh, microeconomics, especially if you're talking about uh, regulation in the water section and the use of concessions. Um, uh, I was quite uh, interested in noticing that the proposed bill asked for a cost of uh, uh, bringing all uh, this, uh, the, the provision of water services in house, regardless from what I understand of whether the concessions were efficient or not. So it was a uh, really a, a decision uh, that seemed to be more, uh, uh, okay, so it's a decision not based on efficiency, but on other considerations. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and, you, and you have to go with what the sort of uh, objective of the client is, which was in this case to estimate the cost. And I suppose being it 16 billion, we're not going to see <laughs> it uh, very, very soon. Um, but let me let me ask you. So the um, I noticed in the application that you asked for a very solid academic background. Some of our students are uh, considering whether to do a PhD or not. Uh, how do you, what would you say about um, uh, uh, the importance of a PhD? Well, generally, to tell the truth, generally we do not, I mean, if one candidate has a PhD, obviously it's welcome, but it's not required. So uh, generally we, uh, the, we have many Italians, young uh, Italian economists, who work in uh, uh, London and Oxford uh, uh, offices because uh, Rome and Milan offices are quite small. We are uh, all over in Italy, seven people, eight people. Uh, but they, uh, well, what we call uh, Team Italy, which are all uh, Italian speakers, Italian born economists, Italian born economists are uh, 25. So, and uh, their, uh, their background, their academic background is a, is a typically a, a, a master in finance or uh, in ethics uh, mm -hmm. or in so not. We have some PhD, but it's not required. OK, this is uh, this is very, very interesting and important. And, in, and you specified also that really a solid microeconomic background, which is also very important. So this is very different from cons for the students from consultancy firms that um, maybe uh, Gabriele will tell us more uh, that instead require more uh, a background in uh, uh, finance, accounting uh, and so on, like Ernest Young or uh, or uh, or others. OK, if uh, are there any questions from the audience? I can tell you that uh, one of the topics of the webinars on uh, lecture online lecture is how to get students involved, because if uh, they hardly ask questions <laughs> when the lecture is uh, synchronous, uh, well, they, they very rarely do when it's asynchronous. Uh, OK, any questions? OK. No, no one. OK, uh, so let us uh, uh, thank you very much, Alfredo, for this uh, interesting presentation. And as I said, I know already someone uh, is a former student of ours from the uh, economics uh, um, masters of science who has gone through more than one stage of interviews up all the way up. Thanks to the uh, opportunities you have informed us about and uh, so these are really great opportunities. Thank you for your time and for being thank here. Thank you. Thank you Elizabeth. Thank you. Bye.
Bye bye. Bye. Okay, so I've been informed that uh, Marco Sebastian is having problem connecting. Federica, is that right? Yes. Will he solve this problem? So it looks like it's a, it's a permanent one. I see. Okay, so let me then uh, move to our uh, next speaker. Uh, if at any time Marco Sebastiani manages to join us, then uh, that will be great. So we have uh, Riccardo Madrigali uh, from Vigen. Um, so Riccardo is founder and CEO of Vigen Lab, an Italian startup that has developed an open innovation platform which helps company to innovate through new generations of startup communities, university and freelancers uh, is a crowdsourcing platform with the highest number of challenges in 2020. This is a big achievement. Ricardo is also founder and uh, CDD of Capital Venture Consulting, a financial advisor company focused on Italian startups and SMEs. So we are very happy to have Ricardo here. He's also uh, here as one of our former students. So during his years at the University of Rome Tor Vergata, he has founded two student associations focused on cultural and social events and on the development of the university uh, ecosystem. His background is in economics and finance and is now in artificial intelligence and neural networks, which is unfortunately, unfortunately, the future. Um, so let me, <laughs> Ricardo, I'm sure will tell us more about uh, about all this. Thank you for being here. Uh, so if you could share your screen and I. Yes. One moment. OK. Can you see it? Yes, yes, yes. OK, perfect. So good afternoon to everyone and uh, thanks, Professor Yossa. It's an honor being here to present what I do and uh, my my personal project, uh, which I share with uh, other colleagues of my university. So uh, what is Wujun Lab? Uh, Wujun Lab uh, was born at the University of Romto Vergata at the end of 2018. We, we, was born, we were born as a, as a community. Uh, we just wanted to um, we just wanted to create uh, uh, a community of uh, talents all around Italy, which uh, who share uh, the passion for uh, social and technological innovation. Uh, what we do right now, and we support companies uh, in uh, the process of open innovation and uh, digital transformations through um, a system. Um, which is called challenge. Uh, what is a challenge? A challenge is a business or social competition. Uh, is a normal competition uh, which uh, companies uh, launched uh, launch on uh, our platform, uh, our uh, online platform, uh, looking for talents or for solutions. So you have to imagine you have um, you are a, a big company. You are looking for uh, uh, some. Um, uh, front-end developers for uh, your um, your website or uh, for your uh, for your platform and uh, instead of uh, uh, creating a, a job announce uh, a job offer you just create a competition and um, so the best ones will, uh, will achieve an internship okay so, uh, which is our our mission? Uh, we want to reinvent the way uh, young people and, uh, in particular, students at the university approach their personal and uh, professional lives. Um, we will see uh, why. And our we our vision uh, is to create a great uh, space where uh, uh, many talents. Uh, and uh, um, ideas uh, can can meet together uh, together with uh, small medium enterprises uh, or with corporates and or with uh, startups so uh, like every business uh, in the world uh, in the world we are um, we were born uh, um, from a problem or from many problems uh, uh, we have seen during our uh, uh, university lives uh, every day uh, we saw that um, University, uh, especially in Italy, maybe 
uh, has, um, has made uh, so much theory, maybe too much theory, but uh, little practice. And um, we saw that companies uh, have difficulties uh, in interacting with uh, the new generations, uh, maybe because of universities, but maybe also because uh, new generations right now have uh, um, different habits, habits, you know, different way of uh, uh, seeing things uh, and uh, work uh, and interact together. And uh, we saw house also that um, there are many difficulties in finding uh, talents and solutions uh, for uh, uh, the, um, the new industry, you know, for technological innovation. And so uh, we think to our solution. Bujan Lab, um, born, as I said before, as a community. Uh, so we just organized events, meet up and what else. Uh, we, we moved forward and we created an online platform. Uh, we taught it uh, a crowdsourcing platform uh, because we uh, we go to the crowd, you know, we, we go to the crowd looking for uh, for solutions, looking for talents. And this platform can connect universities, communities, students and startups. How it works, as I said before, companies launch challenges uh, to, um, to find something on our platform, uh, in particular uh, uh, solutions or talents. So you we can think that there are uh, uh, companies who are looking for a new algorithm and uh, they launch a challenge or as i said before we are looking for some um, uh, for some talents so for for internships uh, okay and solvers uh, respond we, we talk them solvers uh, but they are just users uh, students or freelancers or workers or what else uh, they respond to challenges and uh, they can win uh, they can get rewards they can win uh, an internship or money or uh, it depends on the price on um, on the reward it depends on uh, obviously on the challenge and so who are these uh, these solvers um, we divide them in three clusters students uh, freelancers and startups uh, in order to to involve students to participate and so in order to to distribute these uh, these challenges we have we um, we collaborate with uh, com other other communities uh, and association all around italy and uh, all around europe and with university courses um, which are uh, the benefits for, for the users or for who participate to, to the challenges. Uh, obviously, they can find a job for the platform. Uh, they can earn re uh, rewards. Uh, they can earn some um, uh, rewards in order to uh, develop their, uh, their projects. We, we talked inside the, the company, we talked it uh, corporate innovation and, uh, and obviously they can get available uh, experience for, for their uh, CV. Uh, which are the benefits for the companies? Uh, they can discover solutions and ideas. Uh, they can discover talents. Uh, they um, they boost their brand awareness and employer branding because just imagine uh, you are a company and uh, um, launching a challenge, uh, you can interact in a different way with um, with users, with new generations, and so obviously. Uh, the users uh, and students, uh, they will see differently uh, the company and uh, they can get the database with students data. Uh, this is our business model. So we, we uh, work with companies and uh, companies pay to launch challenges on our platform. Obviously, the pricing depends on the on the type of challenge. Which are the types of challenges? They depend on the need of uh, the company and uh, we divide uh, uh, the needs in uh, three, uh, three clusters, talent acquisitions. So uh, as I said before, when companies are looking for, for talents, uh, open innovation. So when companies are looking for, for solution to innovate business and lead generation, we talk these kind of challenges when uh, uh, the challenge uh, um, is launched for looking for uh, uh, interactions, you know, to promote an event uh, or the participation to a particular workshop, webinar or what else. Uh, these are other kind of activities we um, uh, we organize together with our communities, uh, hackathons and business games, uh, uh, 
many times we organize this kind of um, this kind of initiatives uh, together with uh, with the challenges uh, so inside the challenges is a moment to solve to to help students uh, and the solver uh, to find um, the the final solution and even the workshops uh, or um, for example sometimes we organize uh, um, company experiences inside the companies and these are our uh, university hubs. Gujen uh, is uh, inside uh, um, many universities, many Italian universities. We have uh, some students associations uh, uh, inside uh, uh, two universities in Milan, Bocconi uh, and um, Politecnico di Milano. Uh, free university in Rome, uh, not two, uh, because we announced uh, the new, a new university, a new hub uh, some days ago, and Tor Vergata, um, uh, so the University of Rome, Tor Vergata, uh, Roma 3, and uh, Luis, and one in Singapore. We have an, a, stu a student association in uh, the Essex Business School, and one in Bologna um, at uh, Alma Mater University. So what are these, uh, these hubs? Are uh, just students' association which organize themselves uh, in order to, to compete and to, to participate to these uh, this kind of challenges because many times these challenges can be solved, uh, uh, can be solved in team, not only individually. And these are some university partnerships uh, we, um, we are uh, developing uh, around, um, around Italy. Uh, there are many universities uh, which are, um, um, we have many relationships with, uh, with, with many universities uh, all around Italy. And uh, in particular, an example is a partnership we have with uh, the Baccalaureate in Business Administration and Economics. Uh, we share them uh, free challenges uh, per, per semester. And uh, uh, we have many other partnerships confirmed, so like, for example, uh, with the University of Trieste and the Uni Unitelma, the online University of, uh, of, Sapienza, of Sapienza. Sorry. Uh, so, which is our uh, value proposition? We have a unique value proposition which combines perfectly communities, uh, an online platform, so technology and uh, help. So, we support uh, obviously our users. Uh, uh, to, to solve challenges, we, uh, we support them for uh, every problem they can have and obviously we support uh, um, our companies, so the companies uh, uh, which, uh, which launch challenges in order to assess the output uh, of, um, of solutions, so um, the output of the challenges and uh, um, we help them to find uh, a way to innovate inside, uh, inside their company. This is our numbers, so our traction. Uh, our community uh, right now has uh, uh, 2,000 uh, 2, students all around Italy and uh, uh, outside Italy. Uh, more than 100 are the companies uh, and startups involved in our activities. Uh, more than 20 are the challenges uh, we realized um, in the last uh, six months. And uh, as Professor Essa, Prof. Yossa uh, said before, we are the um, open innovation platform with the highest number of, of challenges in 2020 in Italy. And uh, these are uh, the future articles so we received by Le Fonti TV and Forbes. These are our competitors because obviously, uh, as you know, every business has, uh, has competitors uh, and uh, our main competitor is Agorize. Uh, it's an open innovation platform uh, born in, uh, in Paris. And, um, but our, you know, our, um, um, our more important um, um, key points uh, are uh, analytics and communities. So we don't have, as I said before, only a technology. We don't have only a value propositions, value proposition for companies. We uh, also have uh, uh, communities all around us. We have relationships with university, and we are developing uh, what how can I say um, uh, an association, a social something that involve uh, social needs all around Italy and outside. This is our markets. So uh, obviously we, we divide it uh, 
in uh, uh, the students market and the companies market when we uh, when we talk about companies uh, uh, we talk of uh, small medium enterprises uh, which uh, um, lack of innovation um, lack of innovation and uh, but also we work to we together with corporates uh, especially here in Rome what is the crowdsourcing market? So, um, it's a market which uh, uh, was born uh, uh, maybe 10 years ago in the USA. And uh, uh, this is um, uh, used by the most important global brands, uh, global tech brands like Google, for example, Facebook, uh, Telecom, Panasonic, Microsoft, uh, and uh, every other important player of, uh, uh, of the tech world, you know. And um, uh, millennials representing this segment, uh, uh, the workers uh, which are expected to work an average of uh, um, 12 to 15 uh, jobs during their lifetime. Uh, so the crowdsourcing market um, uh, is that market uh, uh, where companies look for solutions uh, not inside uh, their um, inside their organizations, but outside looking for many solutions so when when you do obviously outsourcing you are you talk with uh, another company uh, you have a uh, um, business interaction interaction with another company and you decide uh, to work with, with that okay but when we talk of crowdsourcing you are looking in crowd for solutions and so you will have uh, many proposals uh, many ideas uh, and so it's, it's a different approach we are talking uh, of a market uh, of uh, 25 billion dollars. These are our milestones. Uh, as I said, we were born in uh, the, the last quarter of 2018. Um, after some months, uh, we went to Milan with our community. And uh, in the second quarter of 2019, uh, we made our market test with our, um, our associations uh, uh, in uh, inside the universities uh, and, uh, and in the last quarter of 2019 so in uh, in November we decided to create uh, our startups uh, our startup and so we um, we prepared a, a business plan a pitch deck and uh, we created a team uh, we we made a product market fit so te testing how our business model uh, and uh, talking with our stakeholders, main stakeholders. We organized our uh, first free challenges uh, and we achieved our first uh, investment round of, uh, um, of 50,000 50, euro. And uh, sorry, I don't. OK, in the second, uh, in the first quarter of uh, 2020, sorry, uh, we achieved the milestone of uh, uh, 10 challenges. Um, and uh, our uh, sorry okay uh, our um, our goals for the next few years uh, are in 2021 uh, in the internationalization so uh, export this format uh, also outside italy especially here in uh, in um, europe uh, in 2022, we want to move to B2C, so we want to sell also additional products to our community, to our members, because students uh, and uh, every user inside our platform uh, uh, obviously uh, don't, um, don't pay anything, everything is free. And in 2023, we want to extend our market uh, to professionals, so we want to um, uh, we want to address this business also to to professionals uh, and uh, to freelancers um, and uh, in um, in 20 in um, um, 2024 we want to become the first crowdsourcing platform for millennials agency in europe and um, uh, our view is uh, to make an exit so to sell our companies or to go to to an ipo in uh, 2000 uh, in uh, 2025 and which are plausible exits for our company obviously with uh, a consulting company or uh, a talent acquisition company like for example uh, Randstad. This is the team and uh, maybe it's the most important uh, slide of this presentation because we are five now six uh, we 
uh, introduced uh, our new marketer uh, some days ago, and uh, she's Ludovica from Roma, from Roma Te, from the University of Roma Te. And we are uh, um, five guys, and we are uh, everyone from the University of Tor Vergata, sorry. We are everyone from the University of, of Tor Vergata. We all studied uh, in the Faculty of Economics. Gabriele is um, my co-founder. He is the CEO of, uh, of Ujan Lab. Uh, I am the CEO. Marco Losso is uh, uh, the head of business development. So uh, he, um, uh, his, uh, his work is to uh, interact with companies, uh, is to sell our uh, to sell our our products so challenges. Federico Brugita is the community manager, so he um, interacts with with students uh, all around Italy. He organizes webinars, uh, events, uh, and uh, everything that concerns uh, the interaction with our community. You no, know? and Federico Nole is our um, we can say our CTO, so he's our uh, uh, engineer. Uh, he's the um, uh, is the, the person uh, which uh, who um, uh, created uh, our our technology is on the the online platform and um, i want to say that it's really it's really cool it's really beautiful that uh, uh, all the team is from uh, the same university and uh, we were born really in as you um, as you read on or uh, as you read in some uh, in some books uh, uh, from Silicon Valley or from uh, from the US USA in general uh, in in the bar you know in, in the bar of uh, of the faculty of, of economics of Tovergata and uh, we in, we made uh, uh, everything inside university we worked inside university for for many many months now we have our office we have um, our headquarter we, we are growing so fast and uh, our goal is, is to become a, a great uh, a great company and to help uh, all uh, all the uh, small medium enterprises in Italy to innovate uh, uh, with students uh, and uh, together with universities. And uh, that's all, uh, I guess. Thank you. And if you have any question, uh, uh, I will be um, available to, to answer. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Ricardo, for this interesting presentation. I'm, uh, I, I feel really proud uh, that, uh, you know, all this came out of our own universities. Really well done. May I ask you to, um, let me tell you something more general to the audience, especially to the Italian uh, uh, students. Um, uh, I have to say that I find that um, um, the entrepreneurial uh, attitude of students in Rome is generally uh, maybe a little bit lower than the one I find uh, in the north of Italy or in northern country. And I think uh, this might be related to the fact that in Rome, Rome is more like the city of public institutions or international institutions. So students don't talk very much about um, setting up their own uh, startup or, or you know uh, realizing their own ideas which is instead something that I find much more frequent in the north and I think this is just uh, uh, something that stems from what is around you No, in Rome is mainly public sector international institutions in Milan is mainly private companies and the same elsewhere and this may be sometimes um, a missed opportunity for students because given that no one talks about this around them, then they don't think about, uh, you know, whether they have an idea that's worth pursuing. So I was very happy that Ricardo accepted to present because he is an exception. And maybe, Ricardo, you want to spend a couple of words really encouraging students to say something that could really encourage students who have ideas to really think about this avenue as a real alternative, not setting up their own firm. Thank you. Yes, yes. Um, as I said, um, as you said in the, in my presentation, uh, I did many things uh, in, um, in university, inside university. I founded the Students Association. I moved uh, so much during my, my university course, and uh, that's why maybe uh, I found this something different in my uh, professional career. Uh, but uh, yes, what I want to know is that um, 
uh, there is an opportunity for, for everyone, there is an opportunity even in Italy, even in Rome, uh, but everywhere, I, I think, to, to develop um, your own ideas, uh, to develop, develop your, your own projects. And uh, I really encourage you to, uh, to try, to, um, to try the, this kind of experience to, uh, to launch yourself uh, in a, um, in this kind of path, in this kind uh, of experience, because I guess uh, uh, is that maybe the the most um, uh, is 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 the most um, away from um, is the most away from pathway uh, in life you can uh, you can live uh, because you you change yourself every day. You work uh, on your own with a team. Uh, everything uh, is not uh, stable. Uh, is 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 in, there is so much, uh, um, how can I say, uh, uncertainty, you know, and everything uh, makes you more uh, um, a more confident person on on yourself. So I encourage everyone to um, to try to to do something on your own. And uh, if you need if you need help, if you uh, are looking for for opportunity like this to um, uh, to start to do um, because you start to do the entrepreneur uh, we can help you you can uh, contact me uh, you can text me i will always be available because uh, uh, i I'm, I'm living this kind of uh, this kind of life uh, and uh, i know that uh, is uh, is really a fascinating uh, pathway and uh, i will i will be uh, i will be pressure to uh, it would be an honor for me to help someone uh, uh, to do this kind of thing and help uh, uh, Italy because we we need this kind of uh, this kind of guys uh, uh, who uh, try to to do something here uh, to to make your your own business. That is very interesting. That is very interesting. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so we have at the moment three challenges, right? On our uh, website yeah. have been launched. OK. Yeah. Uh, are, are any of our students is participating? I don't know. Uh, maybe they can join. They can still join. Yes, okay. absolutely. They can join. We have right now uh, three challenges available on, uh, on our platform. One uh, is uh, uh, with uh, uh, a startup uh, which is called Next. Uh, is um, okay. a, a tech vehicle, and um, the other two are. Mm -hmm. sì, the sorry. other two are uh, um, to chat one marketing challenge together with a startup with the, with the, which is called Sherwood, and the last one maybe is the most uh, interesting challenge we have. It is called Restart Lombardia. We are making uh, a great national project to connect uh, small medium enterprises. Um, which uh, uh, are right now in uh, great difficulty, in big difficulties uh, uh, because of the, the crisis, the, the COVID crisis, uh, to connect them uh, with uh, the new generations, uh, so startups, students, and what else. And so uh, the object of the challenge uh, uh, is to propose your ideas, your solutions, uh, and uh, everything you think could be helpful uh, to overcome crisis. And uh, uh, all of your projects uh, will be uh, will be sent to all the small medium enterprises of uh, Lombardia. Uh, we will do it uh, also for uh, for Lazio and uh, uh, companies uh, who will be uh, interested uh, to develop this kind of project, these solutions. Uh, uh, we'll develop this project together with you. So we have the opportunity to develop uh, your own project, your own idea um, together with, with a company, with entrepreneurs. And so it's a great link, it's a great project. We are doing it with, uh, um, with um, um, Regione Lombardia. And uh, I guess it's, it's a great opportunity for our country to, uh, to connect, to connect together and to do uh, something to overcome this situation. So I really suggest you to do um, to participate. So you Excellent. can find uh, these challenges on our website, okay. uh, uh, Vigenda.it. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Thank, Thank you very you. much. 
OK, um, Federica Corrente is trying to connect to Marco Sebastiani. Any news, Federica? Is he connecting? No, he's still facing problems. OK, so maybe um, meantime uh, uh, we will move forward. And I suppose also Rita, Corrent, uh, Rita De Santis Bruno is having problem. Is she here? No, she's not here at the moment, so okay. we can go on. OK, uh, so let me ask Lorenzo, is this a good time? Can we, Lorenzo Migliaccio? Yes? OK, yeah, sure. so whilst, whilst you get ready, let me spend a few words uh, on your uh, background. So uh, Lorenzo um, is one of our former students. He graduated actually in 2011. And he's uh, since then uh, um, also had a really interesting career path. So Lorenzo is currently a senior associate economist in the competition and economics division of the Financial Conduct Authority, the FCA in London. His work has included analysis of credit information, high cost credit products, non-workplace pensions and retail banking business models for competition and consumer protection purposes. Prior to joining the FSA, Lorenzo was a consultant at Lair in Rome. Uh, and people here uh, will have heard already of Lair. Um, Paolo Bicerossi, who is the director, also teaches for us in Tor Vergata, uh, half of, part of my course in law and economics. Um, so whilst at Lair, he uh, provided economic advice in relation to a variety of antitrust cases covering industries such as financial services, media, transport and groceries. His work at LAIR also encompassed the research projects for the World Bank Group, the EBRD and competition authorities in Italy and the Netherlands. Lorenzo graduated from the EBL in 2013 and obtained his undergraduate degree in economics from the University of Rome Torvegata two years earlier in 2011. Uh, he also completed a master's in competition and market regulation from the Barcelona Graduate School of Economics. Some of our ABL students are also applying. I just recently wrote a recommendation letter from, from one of our students. She might be here, fingers crossed. And, uh, and, uh, and I'm very happy that Lorenzo accepted to come, to come, to, uh, to be here uh, with us to yes, share sorry. his experience. Lorenzo. All right, uh, perfect. Uh, thanks, Professor Yossa. Thanks so much. Uh, I, it, it's a pleasure to be invited to this uh, graduate day. Uh, and uh, I also like to be with you virtually, I guess. Uh, I would have loved to have a long weekend in Rome uh, this week, but this was all before the this whole coronavirus thing started. Yes, yes. So let me check if I can manage to uh, launch the presentation. So yes. can you can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. You, maybe uh, if you put it in a you know a full light. screen mode. Yes, yes. Perfect. What about this. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Right. Uh, okay. Thanks a lot. So um, uh, as as I've been introduced, uh, I I graduated from the EBL in 2013, and I currently work for the Financial Conduct Authority, the FCA in London. Um, the FCA is the authority that regulates financial markets uh, uh, in the UK and in particular I work in the competition and economics uh, division of, uh, of, of the regulator. But I will tell you a bit more about uh, uh, this in a minute. So uh, when I started to think about what this talk should have been about, uh, it was easier for me to think about what the talk should not have been about. So this is not uh, clearly a pitch uh, for the FCA. Um, uh, and this is a, just a sort of a disclaimer. Uh, instead, I think that I will spend um, some time, well, actually just a little bit of time on my journey from university to professional life. And then I will spend most of the presentation telling you about the work that we do at the FCA uh, and offering some hopefully interesting insight into how working in competition policy and financial regulation in the U UK look, looks like. So I I did spend actually an awful lot of time at Vergata because uh, I did my bachelor and then I did the EBL 
Um, and DBL first sparked my interest in uh, uh, game theory and industrial organization. So actually, when I was um, back in the undergrad days, uh, uh, I was really interested into macroeconomics. Um, I, I was uh, reading about boom and bust cycle. I researched the uh, default theory. I was really passionate about all the debate around the, 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 the euro and the and the monetary unions uh, but then i ended up doing more, more of microeconomics and uh, i think at that time uh, professor yossa was teaching game theory and uh, and the other module module the industrial organization was taught by uh, alberto yozzi um so at the, at the ebl i found out that i really liked micro and then i specialized my studies in competition policy and market regulation at the Barcelona Graduate School of Economics. After that, uh, I, I came back to Rome and I worked two years for, for, for this consultancy you, you might have, uh, have heard about there, as mentioned by Professor Yossa. Um, and and the, the work actually at Lair, it was very similar to what uh, 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 Director Macchiati described for Xira, like it's essentially applying economics thinking to, to competition law matters and, and regulation issues. Um, after two years there, uh, I moved again. Um, in 2016, I, I joined the FCA's Competition and Economics Division, and now I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about uh, what, what, what we do at the FCA. Uh, so what does the FCA do? Uh, again, uh, the FCA is the regulator of financial services in the UK, uh, and we have three operational objectives. Uh, we protect consumers, we ensure market integrity, and we promote effective competition. Um, and why is that, uh, particularly the last one? Because we think that promoting effective competition provides benefits to consumers in terms of lower prices, greater choice, better quality and, and innovation. OK, you might wonder then, but how does the, the FCA promote effective competition? Because all these things seems also like this seems quite dry sometimes when, when you read them like on a website or on a document. Uh, so we we do several things. I would say that uh, we use market studies uh, first of all, to assess how a market works and whether it could work better for consumers. So it, the, the, the concept is, is just as simple as that. Um, a market study is a study where we use a range of uh, analytical tools to assess how well the market is working for consumers. So we generally start focusing on a few concerns that we identify right at, right at the start, uh, and these are the so-called theory of arm. Uh, the theories of harm are uh, hypotheses of uh, how a particular harm or risk that you're concerned about uh, uh, might materialize uh, uh, or in the present or, or even in the future, so even potential harm. Um, and, and the aim is if we find that the market is not working particularly well for consumers, is to propose then interventions and remedies that could make the market work better. Uh, so far, market studies have been really the FCA's most uh, heavily utilized tool to address competition concerns. Um, and a market study is, is definitely um, like a big project. Uh, it, it typically involves a large team uh, from 10 to 15 different people, and it lasts for, uh, I think, like a couple of years, probably. And it has different phases. Uh, well, at the very beginning, as I was saying, we work to identify our hypothesis or so-called theories of arm um, of why the market might not be working well for consumers. And uh, then uh, we, we, we do our research. Uh, we end up, as part of that, we issue information requests uh, to firms uh, and we, we, we do customer research, we do consumer surveys and we gather information that we then analyze to try testing our theory of arms. And at the end of it, we publish a report uh, and we issue a consultation period where uh, everyone in the industry, uh, firms and the consumers and, and, and consumer associations uh, actually uh, can 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 give us feedback and 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 they give us their views or what they think about our remedies. Um, so 
market studies, as I've said, is, is very much like uh, the bulk of what the competition uh, uh, division uh, has been doing at the FCA since we, we got competition powers, uh, which is 2013. Um, but we also have uh, more proper enforcement powers to investigate cases where we believe firms might be in breach of uh, uh, the, the, the Competition Act 1998, which is competition law uh, in, in, in the UK. Uh, why did I make this distinction? Because there is a distinction actually. Uh, so uh, sometimes uh, uh, the markets might appear not to be working well for consumers, uh, but there's no obvious contravention to competition or antitrust law. Um, if you have an economics background, you, you, you surely have heard about uh, market failure and this kind of thing, this kind of concept of the market not working well, not necessarily because people are acting in a bad way or because there are conduct issues, but uh, because of a variety of other reasons, which include also asymmetric information, different uh, conflict of interests uh, and, um, and, 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 and the structure of, of the market, which might not be uh, the most uh, the most effective one. Uh, okay, right. But again, what exactly is effective competition? So, I think that what I'm trying to get out here is just trying to give you, uh, like a in a few minutes, a clearer view of uh, first what we look at in our day to day work uh, and the thinking that there is behind what we do and now some of the tools that you acquired through uh, the, the EBL and your, 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 your studies uh, can be applied in, in practical, practical analysis. And in my case, it's economics analysis, but as, gonna, uh, as I'm going to tell you uh, 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 later on, actually we have uh, uh, people coming from a variety of backgrounds and, and multidisciplinarity is key to uh, the work we do and, and, and to good policy. So, this is a very simple model of uh, of a market, but actually it, 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 it's quite it's quite to the point, right? So on, on, on the one hand, uh, you've studied that there, there is the supply where you have firms uh, uh, which uh, produce and deliver uh, a particular good or service. Uh, and on the other hand, you have the demand where you have consumers or, or firms, SMEs, uh, as, as Ricardo was saying, uh, that are demanding for a particular good or service. And these two, these two uh, sides of the market actually interact. And uh, uh, we, it, in, a, in an ideal world, we would like uh, uh, a good inflow of information between these two sides, uh, because effective competition for us would be firms that deliver what the customers needs and are efficient or innovate and they strive and compete to win customers and consumers. And on the other hand, consumers and customers are well informed and engaged and actually will move if they are not satisfied with what they get. So on the demand side, we would like customers, uh, people in general, would like to be able to access, assess and act upon information to decide what's best for them. On the supply side, we would like, again, in an ideal effective competition world, enough firms that compete uh, uh, within each other uh, to win customers without any barriers. But what happens actually in real life is that, uh, and this again could be applied uh, to pretty much like uh, most of the markets around there and, and and certainly it applies to the financial services markets that uh, uh, we, we regulate. Uh, there's something that doesn't doesn't always work and uh, this this uh, what we can call this uh, this virtuous circle may break down because of a number of reasons. Um, on the demand side you might have that consumers don't have access to appropriate information or just don't use it. Uh, they might have difficulties in in comparing products uh, and assessing their value uh, or they can struggle to assess their own long-term needs and bear in mind this is particularly true for financial services where, where these goods and services are inherently complex uh, compared to for example the groceries uh, uh, and uh, at the same time you have little scope for learning for a lot of these products 
how many mortgages would you get in your life? Or like how, how uh, uh, people are not particularly interested in pensions unless they, they get to a retirement age. So it's it, it, it's very it's very much markets where uh, people struggle in assessing information and what's best for them. And then uh, when it comes down to acting, uh, people might be inert um, and uh, and don't switch uh, either because uh, again, like they they don't want to or they don't know they can do it, or because they locked in uh, contracts uh, or they they have to bear uh, a specific cost to, to switch from a provider to 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 a new one. Um, on the supply side, uh, the virtual circle may break again because like you don't have uh, enough firms. Uh, uh, and here, it is not necessarily about the number of firms, but uh, it, it's, it's relevant to assess how big these firms are and how powerful they are in the market. How can they act as a competitive constraint uh, um, between each other and, and how are they free to, 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 to do whatever they want, to set the prices they want and, and, and do, not, uh, do not innovate or provide the good quality if they are not constrained. The, by by other firms or, or potential entrants. Um, we want these firms in the market to, to compete fairly. Uh, and uh, as I was mentioning before, we, uh, we, we, we also have enforcement power. So when we find that uh, firms might be breaching competition law because maybe they're forming a cartel or an anti-competitive agreement, uh, we, 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 we do have the powers to intervene. Um, it could be that there are conflict of interest between consumer and firm because of course like uh, uh, at the end of the day like firms want to make profits and consumers want to get the the, the goods and services they they prefer the most so uh these in these uh, interests are not always aligned uh and uh, when i say uh without undue barriers uh, uh the the barriers uh, to competition can be of different types uh, and uh, we we will, for instance, look at uh, uh, barriers created by 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 the structure of the markets. So maybe some markets. Uh, well, it is not necessarily the case with many financial services. But well, for instance, uh, it's really hard sometimes to compete uh, in some retail markets in financial services if you don't have like a, a great back book of customers. So there are banks with been. Uh, around for for decades now, which have an inherent strategic advantage uh, compared to uh, new new entrants. Uh, but we also look at barriers uh, that uh, can be uh, created by regulation and, and the government. Like for instance, a few years ago, the FCA did a study on uh, capital requirements for banks, where we actually realized exposed uh, that the rules in place. Uh, uh, for, for capital requirements for banks uh, were hindering competition and were creating a barrier to, to potential entrance into the market uh, that uh, uh, we, we, we would have uh, really liked to, uh, to, to come in and, and compete with incumbents. So, um, and this is like my last slide. Uh, as I mentioned, I think a, a multidisciplinary approach uh, is key. Uh, what I found since I start working, honestly, uh, at least like in competition, is that you really need uh, uh, a bunch of tools, uh, which is essentially the stuff that you studied, uh, which will help you understand different things. So in the example that I, I, I made before about the virtual circle, we would use uh, uh, insight from game theory and industrial organization to try and understand the structure of the market at first. So whether it is an oligopoly or whether there is a, there, 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 there's a different structure with more competitors, or like uh, um, with the market is concentrated in the hands of uh, five, six players and then there's a fringe of smaller players. And that would help you understand also like firms incentives. Uh, we use statistics and econometrics uh, to empirically test uh, our assumptions uh, of how the market works uh, from very, very, very simple like uh, uh, statistics like looking at price trends and correlation to, to, to more complex models where we try to test causal effects. Uh, we use competition law to assess uh, if firms conduct is anti-competitive uh, and uh, in breach of, of, of the competition law in the UK. In our case, 
we use behavioral economics. We have a behavioral economics unit where uh, there's people that we have a background of uh, psychology and uh, some of them, are, but not all of them are study economics. Uh, and uh, it's really important to understand uh, uh, customer, uh, con con consumer behavior and all the behavioral bias that can be at play in financial services like risk aversion. It's something that you, you see a lot when it comes down to investment products. Uh, and then we use a lot of financial analysis uh, to assess the, the firm's via viability. Uh, we look at balance sheets, uh, we look at the costs, the revenues, and the rationale the firms might have for for pricing or, or marketing pro product in a, in, in a particular way. So I guess my, 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 my main message is, uh, again, a multidisciplinary approach is key. And, and I think if uh, one thing I wish that I have known before is the interlinkages between all these different uh, subjects. Uh, I when like when when I was the, back at uni, I didn't really focus, uh, for instance, on accounting because I thought I wouldn't have used it. But actually, it came out that uh, years later, uh, I, I was heavily involved in some financial analysis, and I thought, oh, oh I wish I had done before how to use this and all these subjects and tools that are outlining here are interlinked uh, and uh, I think it's like like a good economist or, or, or a, a good a good policymaker should take into account all these things um, and uh, the, the multidisciplinary approach lead me to my last point which is just uh, for clarity uh, I'm an economist by background uh, but the FCA doesn't only hire uh, economists or competition economists, uh, no people who have already have knowledge of financial services. Um, like for instance, when I joined the FCA, I did have knowledge of competition. I didn't know anything about financial service. I did work on a case when I was a lawyer, but uh, I didn't know much. And this is knowledge I gained over the years. I, I guess the main thing is to try to think uh, what you studied, the things that interest you the most, uh, and how can you make the most out of them and, and look for the interlinkages, look for how you can apply these things to, 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 to real life problems. And there was that, I guess, and there was my last slides. With your uh, contact information. Um, Lorenzo, this has been extremely useful. Uh, thank you very much. Of course, you are an insider in the sense that uh, um, you started at Tor Vergata and you, you, you are a student of EBL and have had uh, having a wonderful career and it was very uh, not prepared, of course, very interesting what you were saying about the multidisciplinarity because we tried to keep this a little bit in the in the program uh, and uh, and I students have uh, many optional courses that they can take or now also from other faculties we had the student uh, this year was taking uh, organization psychology uh, and as you mentioned uh, even this can be uh, relevant in the in a job like the one you are doing uh, so this has been extremely useful let me let me ask you two questions uh, I mean uh, by the way when I was in London I did some work for the Financial Service Authority at that okay. time they were investigating the rule uh, and potential uh, sort of uh, sources of bias of uh, uh, financial advisors and uh, they were really ahead of time because it was that was must have been uh, 2003 or something there was really not much discussion around and they uh, asked me to 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 do a model and uh, you know about uh, uh, using game theory how financial advisors incentive work uh, based on reputational incentives and then the whole thing uh, you know uh, the, the crisis and whole thing came up so I'm I'm aware that uh, you know the, the the UK organizations do a marvelous, really very very interesting work. And um, can I just ask you a question? This is uh, the same I asked Alfredo Macchiati earlier on. Um, uh, so your experience, you did the bachelor, then the the um, our uh, EBL, then you went to study in Barcelona, where you specialized on competition regulation. Would you say that it's important to do a PhD? to our students and second question uh, if they have to prepare for an interview I think I know the answer but I think don't all students know what do they have to do for a job like yours okay thanks uh, so 
Uh, on the first question, uh, I'd say, like like Alfredo said, no, I think a PhD is not uh, is is not strictly needed. Is welcome if you have it, but uh, it, it is not. And uh, um, we have a lot of uh, a lot of Italians actually working in my division. But as a whole, um, the FCA, like of course, like it mostly it's mostly Britons, and many people here actually have, have just a bachelor. So, so it is not expected that you even have a master before you right. jump into a work like this. So, um, then, of course, like in in, in the UK, they, they used to 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 gain practical experience and to do internship while they do the bachelor, which is not necessarily something that we do in Italy. Uh, but uh, I think it's uh, uh, from 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 uh, from a CV perspective. Uh, uh, a bachelor and the EBL would be more than enough to to try applying for 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 That's a role in, in 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 the UK institutions and also like uh, on uh, on the, the, the there's there's a there's a really really good website of the civil service where you can search for vacancies uh, across uh, regulators and as other public okay. institutions in the UK, uh, okay. which might 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 be interesting. Um, and, and in terms of uh, the interview. I think that uh, sometimes, uh, well, me too, at the very beginning when I started to do interviews in the UK and in the public sector, I wasn't prepared uh, for the competency based approach where you, you, you part of the interview, of course, they're going to test your, your technical skills. So that, that needless to say, you have to prepare for that. But you also have to prepare to answer questions like, uh, um, Tell me about the time where you use judgment in your work or your your university uh, career. Tell me about how you delivered something uh, for, for, from start to end. And uh, this is not th this could be tricky questions if you if you never prepare for those. But uh, I guess once you you start practicing, it's just a matter of uh, uh, organizing your thinking and and structuring your answer in in a particular way. Excellent. Uh, I think this is uh, very interesting. Let me tell you that uh, we have um, uh, Ricardo Zecchinelli also. Was it he? Was he in your year, Ricardo? Was it uh, former? No, maybe uh, a couple I of years. Was, I think it was yeah. before, but I met uh, him before. Longer. Yes, exactly. Ricardo is also was working for the competition uh, authority, and uh, and then uh, from economics we have a couple of students are working for for RBB or. Um, um, Frontier, and the I think it's not trivial, but uh, the, the, so I want to stress this. Uh, you know, these kind of jobs you really need to prepare, as uh, yeah. Lawrence was saying. I mean, uh, if you want to apply for a job in competition policy, then you should read the Massimo Motta's uh, book three times. Uh, you know, over the uh, the the weeks be um, leading heading leading to the to the to the interview. Uh, and uh, advice on exactly how to prepare is something to look for. OK, Lorenzo, so we, we are um, uh, running on time. I'm very proud. Thank you so much for your help. Uh, you, I saw that you also put your uh, email address. So I suppose if there are students who, uh, you know, may want to ask further question or some advice to Lorenzo, you are making yourself available, which is very kind. Uh, so we build the, the network. Uh, so thank you again for being here sure. and all the best. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Uh, OK, so Federica, do we have Marco Sebastiani or not yet? No, not yet. Unfortunately, no. we are not able to have this connection. I'm trying to contact also Rita. OK, OK, so we move on with Gabriele Silvestri. Gabriele, OK, let me let me name. Let me say a few things. Uh, so um, sorry, Federica, just one thing, but I did see him online for a brief for a few minutes. Sorry, right. can you repeat, please? I, I, I did see Marco Silve um, uh, Silvestri online for a few minutes. No? Yeah, Gabriele is online. Sebastian, yes. No, sorry, Marco Sebastiani, I mean. He was online for a few couple of minutes, I oh, think. OK, so we will try. OK. Uh, OK. So we have uh, Manju is asking a question to Lorenzo, but uh, Manju, please now send that question to Lorenzo directly. So we move on with uh, Gabriele Silvestri. I'm very thankful that Gabriele joined us here today. 
So uh, Gabriele graduated with honors ABL in November 2014 with a thesis on the Italian leniency program. So he was also uh, thrilled by competition policy and he started working at Ernest Young even now, uh, I think if, yes, it was a week, a few weeks before graduating. So this uh, is an, yeah, amazing, very well done. Uh, first, he worked as an auditing intern and then as public sector consultant. And then uh, for over three years, he has been working as business analyst in Vitalia, the Italian agency for business development. Uh, they they do have lots of interesting programs for startups, uh, I recollect, and dealing with the subsidized finance for large industrial investment programs. And as of January 2020, he started, he decided to take a step back in a sense uh, to then make a, a jump, big leap forward uh, in the future. So he's now uh, started an MBA, executive MBA at the Ecole Superior de Commerce de Paris. Uh, uh, and uh, so Gabriele, the floor is yours. Uh, please share your screen and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, and thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm really happy for the year sharing with you my experience and I hope uh, it will be useful for assessing whether EBL can be and how is useful uh, in the in the path uh, in the working world after graduation. Uh, so um, a, a little preamble is needed. This is absolutely not um, a celebration of my profile and my career, but just a sharing I'm sure all the today EBL students will have a, 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 a career as brilliant as mine and, and even more. Uh, just let's start spending few words, few words on, on my thesis, which is uh, the first step, uh, the last step I did in, 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 my, in university. Uh, as Professor Yossa were saying, uh, it was a, lin uh, a, leniency, uh, a thesis on leniency program and in particular on the Italian leniency program. Um, what leniency programs are, uh, I'm sure you know or you are going to know very soon, they are a tool in the fight against cartels consisting in ben benefits in terms of uh, immunity or fine reduction offered by antitrust authorities to companies that spontaneously denounce cartels in which they participate. Uh, in particular, my thesis was, um, as a, was a, double, as a double approach, a more theoretical one trying to make a, a model of how leniency programs work uh, in theory and a more practical one uh, consisting in the analysis of 63 Italian cartel cases uh, between uh, 2000 and 2013, of which only five cases were concluded using the Italian leniency program um, instrument. Uh, my data set consisted so of uh, 467 organizations and, and I collected data concerning 23 different variables. It was uh, a huge work uh, of, of deepening and uh, and assessing, I tried to to assess in, in basically the impact of the Italian leniency programs uh, on on competition, uh, um, focusing on three uh, indicators of effectiveness: the firm's information revelation, the investigation cost reduction, and the cartel deterrence effect. Um, I used, of course, some uh, proxy variables and some uh, econometrical tools in order to assess the impact of uh, Italian leniency programs on these indicators. And I ended up discovering that basically uh, such a program has had no effect in Italy. Um, so generally speaking, was like a, it has been like a failure. Uh, or at least up to 2013. But sometimes discovering a failure is, uh, in a sense, um, a success in, in speaking in terms of research results. 
Now I would like to share with you my my steps so far in the in the working world, uh, and I will try to focus on the EBL contribution to my professional development, but also trying to stress out which have been the main obstacles I found in uh, in approaching to to the working world and what which kind of skills I have had the, the necessity I've had to to integrate to my profile. As Professor said, I starting I started with an internship a um, few few weeks before graduating at Ernest Young, the, the big consulting company um, as auditor. Uh, you know what uh, what an auditor do. Uh, it, it is about the inspection of financial statements for accuracy of reporting and in, in, in particular um, in the sense of compliance with the law and regulations. Uh, with, I tested deterrence, uh, I tested the effectiveness of internal controls over financial reporting. Um, I, prepare, I used to, to prepare together with my colleagues and present uh, to management reports on audit findings. In this vein, it, it seems strange, but even in a field so 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 far from the the EEBL background, something uh, returned very useful for me. Uh, in particular, due to the interdisciplinary uh, aspect and, and of EEBL, I, I I succeeded in dealing with something diverse, uh, and also time management meeting deadlines in, in the very first experience in my work in my work uh, path uh, was very pressure precious for me uh, and also coming from an international develop environment how EEBL is was was very important because even at least in Italy sometimes even in such large uh, large organization um, uh, it is not that common to have a, a very young worker working properly in English with a, a very specific language uh, in, in economics and uh, uh, coming from a real international environment. However, I hit it very strong against my, my lack of knowledge uh, uh, concerning accounting principles. I've had to, to struggle to, to learn it. Uh, and even it, it, it could it could seem silly, but even some basic uh, Microsoft Office tools uh, was um, a, a little obstacle for me. Uh, I exited from a university be, uh, believing that I was able to to working prob properly with uh, Excel, uh, uh, Word, uh, and even even PowerPoint, but it was not the truth. Uh, today, the working world uh, requires to even to young workers to to be very, very uh, skilled in, 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 with Microsoft Office tools. So, so a, a little suggestion is to um, to be prepared when you to approach when you approach to 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 your first work experience to be able to to manage these tools properly. Uh, so uh, I moved on. My my first contract, my first real contract, was in a slightly different field, uh, in, in the consultancy sector, uh, in particular related to the to the public sector. What did I do? Uh, I, I, we provided consultancy to public administrations for the performance improvement of management. Uh, and, and we provided support and technical assistance to the public administration for the EU funds management. Uh, moreover, we evaluated pu public policies uh, and activities implemented by both public administration, but also in international organization. As before, we, I try to, to focus on what EEBLs contributed in my, in my development in, in this in this period of my life, um, and I, I feel more in, in my comfort zone in this experience because uh, the knowledge of European institutions coming from uh, EBL um, students, the EBL path uh, was very pressure, precious for, for me. Um, but also some themes that I never believed would be 
so useful in working life uh, was like uh, public choice, public economics, but also advanced management uh, are all courses that sounded very, very important for the application in the real working world. On the other hand, as before, I'd like to highlight something I've had to, to focus on in order to continuously improving and enriching my profile. And this is uh, in particular competencies on EU funds uh, functioning. Because even though EBL provides you a general knowledge on the EBL institution and uh, on European institution and, and European history, uh, the functioning of the EU funds is a very peculiar way of, uh, of thinking and it's a whole entire world uh, um, working uh, on a side. Uh, and also public policies evaluation methods uh, were not covered completely by the EEBL program and I have had to, to learn them a little bit. But I feel that in, in this vein I've had some basic tools in order to, uh, to face this uh, learning process. Uh, starting from three years ago, I am a financial analyst at Invitalia, which is the uh, national agency for business development. We are a private company owned by the Ministry of Economics and Finance of, of Italy. Uh, what do we do? Uh, basically, we, um, we assess uh, evaluation on investment programs of firms asking for public grants. Uh, so we look at financial and administrative assessment for the provision of public grants to firm. Uh, and this implies financial statement and business plan analysis, credit risk evaluation, feasibility studies on investment programs, and, and of course, reporting activities. But also it is a matter of management of national and EU funds for supporting large, but even small uh, industrial or private investments. Uh, why EBL was uh, very useful for me in this vein? Uh, because it is a very complex work. Uh, so uh, EBL helped me in, uh, in understanding how to govern in complexity in evaluation, taking into account several factors. Uh, but also the topics like European com competition law, that when I was studying them, I never believed it, it became so useful in my, in my practical activities in, my work, in the working world, and also uh, industrial economics, of course. Uh, why? Because uh, every day we apply in practice the principle of uh, TFEU regulation uh, and, and of article, or in particular concerning uh, competition policies about the Article 107.3. Uh, what, what I needed to add to my to my background and to my profile, of course, uh, the specific regulation about public aids and basic uh, tools concerning financial accounting. Uh, financial accounting is another uh, topic that I didn't faced properly during my uh, academic career uh, and I would so if you have the possibility please deepen this uh, this topic if you can choose uh, an optional course or I don't know if this kind of course has, has become a compulsory for EBL in the meanwhile uh, but this is a, 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 okay, a little we... piece of advice uh, yes professor what, what what were you saying? No, no, it's fine. I've, I've seen that the Rita manages uh, to join us, which is really good. OK, Gabriele. I, I'm uh, concluding. Uh, very, uh, very interesting. And then I'll like, come back to you about the, the, the skills you were highlighting that we need, which is very useful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure. And um, finally, uh, while while working for Ibitalia, in Vitalia, I started as, as the professor uh, anticipated uh, the executive master at ESCP's business school 
Uh, it is a, a quite prestigious master. It is a very, very interesting, and it is a very highly ranked. Uh, and and I'm I'm so proud of of being part of this course of study. Um, what is e ESCP? Uh, ESCP is a um, is a business school uh, established in Paris in, in the late. Uh, in 1819, uh, okay. so it is the first world business school. It has six campuses in Europe, in Paris, Berlin, London, Madrid, Turin and Warsaw. Uh, and the program, the executive MBA, is an MBA designed for professionals. Uh, it is a long program because it, it is part time as a weekend formula. Uh, so it is it, it lasts 30 months, Okay, uh, pretty long. Uh, it, it consists of nine core courses, 10 elective, five seminar and one consulting project. And the most interesting, in, in, interesting thing is that it is itinerant. So I am based in Turin, but I will do my courses all over Fantastic. Europe in the campuses in the ESCP campuses in Europe. A uh, few words about the class profile, yes. more than 100 participants, more than 30 nationalities, 38 average age, so I'm pretty younger than average and 13 ah. years average professional experience. So I am a bit proud for saying that uh, being part of this course has been tough and also Very uh, good. stimulating. Few words on the EBL because I, I, think, I think I think two words <laughs> because okay. we're running out of time. The, multi the multicultural environment, it, the yes. interdisciplinary background, the international yeah. teaching set, standard and the European focus. So it this was pressure that. for my admission to the course. That's great. Thank you so much. Everybody uh, guys. And thank, thank you, you so guys. much. Let me say let me say two things since you've left. So we now have Excel as one of the sort of um, extra activities. So students uh, get credits for doing them. And Marco Sebastiani, who has not been able to join us, unfortunately, maybe will manage later but um, was uh, scheduled to give a talk on European funds and how to apply for uh, for uh, funding programs in Europe. So these are the exactly uh, things I'm doing. It is true we still don't have a ac uh, financial accounting course, so this is uh, food for thought. Uh, thank you so much for, for you know, uh, you. The, the advice. It's so nice to see how well you're all doing. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I, I did not know that the ex average age in executive MBA was uh, 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 that the one. And so you're super young and this is great. So all the uh, best. It may be a double cut because uh, I could not exploit all the potential of this uh, course, but I will have to learn a lot. So. And, and that is great. And as long as we learn, you know, we're not wasting time. That's uh, definitely one thing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabriele. So let me now introduce our, um, our next speaker is uh, uh, Rita De Santis Bruno. Rita, can you uh, turn on the camera? So we managed to have Rita with us and it's really nice <laughs> yeah. to see her again. Uh, uh, so she entered with uh, Federica Corrente Credential, but the the, the <laughs> The the lady you're seeing is uh, is Rita. Um, so let me just say a few words uh, about Rita, and it's uh, really nice to see her again. So uh, Rita graduated the EBL in 2010 so, um, with a thesis on the empirical evidence of the witness curse in um, FCC auctions, and the uh, after work. Uh, after working for um, a consultancy company that uh, was set up at that time by a bunch of professors interested in procurement, um, including myself <laughs> as a junior economist, uh, where she was advising clients on competition issues, strategic procurement design and vendor rating systems. In 2011, she joined the NL Group and uh, she's been there, uh, there since. Uh, uh, she has developed sound experience as a regulatory professional, first with a focus on the energy sector and then with a focus on financial markets. She's currently head of uh, the Financial Regulation Compliance Unit for Enel. 
and uh, uh, outside the office, which is also very important. Uh, she enjoys traveling and reading uh, as we all do, as we also do. Not sure we all, but uh, so she's looking forward for this uh, pandemic to be over to travel again. Rita, thank you for your time for being here. We can see your slides, so we could you, see your slides now. Yes, uh, very good. OK, OK, can you see them? Yes, yes, so sorry. If First of all, for the, the delay, I apologize for it. And I thank you again for uh, this opportunity to, to be in this day. Um, I will give you just a short introduction, introduction on my background. Uh, Professor Yossa said uh, almost everything there was to say. I will just add that uh, as a part of my background, I have also um, I participate. I spent my, semester, my spring semester uh, abroad uh, at Southern University in Stockholm in 2009. That was actually, uh, let's say, uh, the the fruit of the inspiration um, I gathered at uh, the EBL, uh, where I enrolled in 2007. And um, I graduated, as said, in 2010 with uh, a strong interest in competition economics, in antitrust and behavioral economics and European law. Uh, in 2010, right after my graduation, I joined uh, uh, Advanced Procurement. And when I say right after, I mean uh, really the, the week after my graduation. So I really started working uh, as soon as I, I graduated, but I, I, I'm sure that you are not really interested into into this, and you are probably more interested in what has been my, not not just my academic uh, path, but also my development journey. I don't like to call it a career. I don't like this term. I would uh, call it a development journey in uh, in an L, uh, from energy to financial regulation. As I said, I had a flair for uh, for European law and for regulation. And uh, in 2011, I was hired in the regulatory and an antitrust team. At that time, it was a, an international team, uh, but I was um, focusing more on uh, uh, the regulation, the Italian regulation of energy market. Um, in 2013, I had the chance to participate in the annual training of the regulation of energy utilities at the Florence School of Regulation, which is one of the um, well-known uh, schools of uh, regulation in Europe, especially for the power sector. My experience as, um, um, uh, as energy regula um, regulatory professional uh, ended in 2016, so after five years. Uh, when I joined the risk control team, I, um, I really wanted to uh, work on, uh, to, to have a broader perspective, uh, to work in a more international uh, environment uh, on uh, European regulation, not just uh, uh, country based uh, uh, regulation. And uh, uh, also to um, learn something more and something different with respect to what I was doing, what I've been doing so far. So I joined the risk control team, where in particular the financial regulation compliance team, and here I had the chance to uh, ensure consistent compliance to financial regulation, meaning uh, uh, ensuring that the group uh, is compliant to um, uh, regulation applicable to operation of financial markets uh, and uh, uh, issuance of uh, financial instruments. And as uh, Professor Yassa said, I was appointed at the financial regulation compliance at uh, the beginning of this year for uh, if that's worth <laughs> anything um, as a, a milestone. But what, what does it mean to be a regulatory professional? I, I had some uh, um, difficulties before uh, in uh, connecting, but I, I was listening to carefully to the presentation uh, done before, and this has been uh, somehow presented from the other perspective, the, perspec the perspective of the regulator. But what does it mean to be a regulatory professional within a corporate, within a company? Uh, first of all, I must say that for those of you who are interested in regulation, uh, being a professional in this sector means to have a really in-depth knowledge of the rules of the game. 
when you are in a company, sometimes you are uh, the regulatory officers or, compl or uh, compliance officers are, um, uh, you know, uh, with with respect to business, to those who are more closer to the business and um, uh, produce value. That, that, that's what they, they say in the company. They are often uh, looked at with some kind of, um, uh, with some suspicion sometimes. But I must say that uh, regulatory professional really, th those who know the regulation knows how the market works. Eh? Uh, and uh, in the energy regulation is particularly true because if you know if you have an in-depth knowledge of energy regulation, you know how the, the value chain works. And this is a very complex value chain. But what does it mean in the daily, uh, on a daily basis? It means that you, first of all, you, you study, of course, uh, the regulation, you monitor the evolution of the regulation, you provide support to business area to assess their impacts, you have to manage trade-offs because in particular in big uh, corporations like Enel, where there are different, di com composed by different souls. And sometimes you have to manage um, trade-offs between different area impacted by the same piece of regulation. You have to establish a uh, relationship with competent authorities, with associa associations of industries and other stakeholders in order to um, represent the position as a company. And you need to support the operational compliance by uh, establishing process together with the business and also establishing policies. This is, a, I would say, a general perspective on a regulatory professional, which is was, was true when I was uh, an energy uh, regulatory professional, as well as now, as I am more focused on uh, financial markets. Uh, what is my EEBL heritage? So uh, when I was um, thinking about how to uh, structure this, pre this presentation, I thought these guys, if, if they managed to, to get at 7, 7 p.m. listening to me, they probably want, would like to understand not really my history, but what um, the EBL participating, being enrolled in such a master course has um, uh, provided me as a competitive advantage. And first of all is the network. Uh, building a network is a very uh, popular um, idea in the professional world. Um, uh, it's a, it's a, a, an overabused sometimes uh, um, idea. Uh, you need to build your con to build your network to establish a network of people because it may help you in uh, pursuing your daily activity and um, uh, make your career flourish. Uh, the network I built uh, in the EBL was more valuable to me than this. I attached a strong, uh, a stronger uh, meaning to this, and I, I am linking to the, to the network that Professor Yossa said before, uh, because uh, these are these were my 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 friends. They still are some some of them. They are my colleagues, and this is the the network I appreciate more, and uh, um, and academics as well. Uh, so uh, in this ten years time span, I since I've graduated, I I can recall a couple of times or maybe even more that I came back to Professor Yost asking for advice. So I think it's a, it's a valuable network you you establish. You don't realize this. You realize later in the in your, in the future. It is of course a stimulating environment. It is an environment that has provided me with. Uh, uh, a lot of inspiration from uh, from other uh, colleagues and students. Uh, so I won't uh, discuss that much. I would, would like to focus on the last two uh, bullet points because I think that the EBL provided me with a business card uh, and some tools. Uh, business card means that uh, at that time, 10 years ago, when I, uh, when I graduated, uh, um, the Faculty of Economics at the University of Vergata was very highly regarded. Uh, at the professional uh, among companies, and it still is. So that that it's that it's a first business card you have, and then uh, within this, within the Faculty of Economics at the University of Vergata, being uh, coming from the EBL, was probably uh, another um, point which was uh, adding value 
to my CV, I guess. It provided me the tools. Uh, if you are lucky enough, you will use uh, your, uh, uh, the economic theory you learn uh, at, uh, at university on a daily basis. Uh, uh, probably as a consultant at Oxira <laughs> or uh, uh, in other firms, but in, in, in the private sector, in corporates, this is um, a little bit more difficult. So you you learn, uh, you train on the job, I would say. But what is important is that you have the right tools. So you have the right mindset the right economic tools to understand the world, uh, to uh, provide uh, um, robust reasoning and thoughts. And this is the feeling I had uh, EBL uh, provided me. So business card and a compass to navigate in the professional world. And of course it has provided me with work opportunity because uh, the work opportunity in AP, in advanced procurement, came from uh, um, the relationship, the network I established with the professor Sato Vergata, and also in NL, because um, I didn't mention this, and I wanted to mention here that I, I happened, I had the chance to make an interview at uh, in NL, because I replied to uh, a job vacancy that was published uh, and uh, make, made available only through uh, the Faculty of Economics uh, channels. Uh, there was a ser career service uh, linking uh, uh, students. Uh, newly graduated and uh, companies, and I uh, answered to this uh, job vacancy. Now, some tips for you, if you are, uh, uh, let's say, um, prospective uh, uh, graduate, or you are at the early stage of your uh, career, and these are tips, very, let's say, common, uh, common sense tips. But uh, in my experience, they are. Uh, uh, it, it is useful to perhaps to stress them again because uh, uh, what I have seen, not as much as uh, as uh, interviewer, I have not not much. I have not much experience so far on this point, but also talking with my colleagues is that when uh, a young Mm, a newly graduate enter the professional world, some common sense and basic principle uh, uh, sometimes are not uh, are not that common probably and they and it's useful to uh, to stress them again. So before graduating, uh, I uh, really encourage you to develop your quantitative and analytical skills uh, because uh, um, it will provide you with a competitive advantage. Uh, what I see right now is that companies uh, really look for uh, quantitative profiles. As I said, you may not end up using them. I have not, uh, but it it will. You, you never know, but you mm, it will provide you with a competitive advantage on your CV. So mm, really develop your quantitative and analytical skills. I remember Professor Yosta stressing the fact that uh, the, we need to um, to work uh, to get our hands dirty on, with data, and uh, I think it, it paid off. Now, learn other languages. This is really trivial. It may seem trivial, especially for you who are attending or uh, thinking to attend, uh, thinking of attending a, a, an, in, a, an English thought master course. But, what I'm, but why I'm saying this? Because uh, you, if you are already an EBL, you already have a competitive advantage from this point of view. Ten years ago, this competitive advantage was uh, was big. Now, I guess it's going, it's getting thinner. Uh, you still have it because what I heard from other colleagues uh, we, who are much more involved in the hiring process is that uh, still we see in 2020 poor performances uh, in uh, in language skills, especially in English. So this is especially for the Italian native speakers. Focus also on other languages because you you still have a competitive advantage. Use your time to increase this competitive advantage and think of a PhD. Uh, this uh, is another link to something that has been discussed before. Uh, 
um, and it's a tip from my personal experience. I have really enjoyed to, uh, uh, to, to pursue an academic career. Uh, nothing has stopped me, uh, but mm, it's just that, as I said, I really started working right after. And uh, if you enter in the professional world, the professional world is a roller coaster. So uh, it's I'm not saying that it's impossible. I'm saying that it's hard to take a step step back. So please, if you are interested in taking a PhD, thinking about it now, before, right after the graduation. Uh, do not think that, OK, I will see how it goes. I will start working. I will start making uh, taking some interviews be and, and see what happens because uh, uh, it will be it will be very hard to come back. Searching for a job. Uh, be consistent in your CV and interviews. This is basic uh, common sense. As I said, what we are seeing as a recu recruiter is that uh, it is not at all. And uh, why? Uh, if you write in your CV that you have um, some uh, experience, basic use that you are a basic user of basic user of MATLAB, expect to uh, get some questions on it. It doesn't mean that you have to that having written one or two lines of codes in uh, in MATLAB doesn't mean that you are a basic user. So be consistent and be honest in your CV and also in your interviews. Uh, do not be uh, afraid to uh, be honest about your um, ambition as well. I recall uh, my job interview at Danel. It was a two tire uh, selection process. In the first, uh, the first process was uh, uh, a psycho uh, um, aptitudinal, uh, I guess, um, test. The second one uh, was a technical interview. And in the first one, I, uh, as I said, I applied for a regulatory position, but I, in the end, the position was filled. So I was called to participate in a group interview, group uh, uh, psychoaptitudinal um, interview for another position, which I really didn't like. And uh, I take a risk and I told I told this at the, the job interview. So show your ambition, show show it politely. Of course, don't be arrogant, but uh, uh, take a risk to show really what 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 is your uh, what are your really your interests that will pay off. Maybe not in the super short time as it did for for me, but it will uh, uh, it will later uh, job interviewers really appreciate honest people um, with regard to the experience you 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 put in your cv and uh, uh, your uh, uh, expectation of future careers finally study for your job interview this uh, may seem really trivial again uh, i have direct experience it is not uh, I, it, I happen to interview people who were not prepared for my for the job interview and uh, uh, trust me, I am not a tough interviewer. <laughs> I am not not that tough. Uh, here I have written know your oil price. I remember that when I was interviewed, um, HR prepared me uh, saying, please come to the interview to the technical interview at least mm, reading on the newspaper what is the oil price because they were frustrated my former boss could not find anyone who could properly answer to this question and in general it was really a tough interviewer and didn't like anyone so i did not only study the only price i studied the the, the, the trends and of course i studied the regulation of the power sector in italy of course Looking backwards, not uh, I did not could not feel uh, the the knowledge in uh, a cu the couple of days I had to prepare myself, but I studied a lot, and this is what I suggest you to do. Because uh, if if in an interview, as it happened to me, I uh, realized that the, the you know, potential employee has not put any care in these interviews, I I'm sorry, but I I don't fall in love with uh, with it especially if then uh, if you say things that which are not which are incorrect and you then uh, uh, say that one of your uh, 
uh, best uh, soft skill is to be accurate. So that's the consistency. Oh, that's you know, very between. interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Rita, no, it's very interesting what you're saying because, uh, you know, we are, um, so since you've left, we've done a few things. Yeah. So my microphone is on. My microphone, can you hear me? Yes, definitely. Yes. Okay, so we now have um, career skills, soft skills seminars, and uh, where we, we in, in this year, we also had an interview skill uh, seminar. But uh, it's never enough to stress how important it is uh, to be uh, deep in uh, in the application process. Uh, uh, so now, when we receive um, 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 in, uh, news about an opportunity in a company, we circulate the opportunity to our students, and we ask students to send us a motivation letter and uh, a CV. And uh, it's been uh, we're putting a lot of effort because still today very often these motivation letters are uh, very general and uh, show that the students spend no time at all on uh, actually getting uh, information about that particular company, that particular position and so on. And, uh, and I never, um, uh, I think it's, it's very important to stress that that is something that makes the difference. Um, if the students uh, being on the other side uh, may not know this yet, they think, OK, my, my CV is good. They will see my exams and so on. But as uh, Rita is highlighting, you know, there are things you convey by having spent time on uh, getting information about the job, about the company and having prepared in a technical way for an interview. So this is um, very useful and I am sure our current students will uh, will appreciate this advice. Oh, uh, you want to say something else or? Um, just uh, one minute, some uh, yes. food for thought on uh, what I see are the cross sector macro, macro trends uh, in case you are interested in, uh, uh, I mean, to, to make some research and to and learn what, what you can do in the future. So what I say is a great role uh, of sustainability and this is a cross sector trends from business sustainability as a business model not just as a statement mm, to say that we are, uh, that a company is nice and it's uh, doing uh, great in taking care of its uh, shareholders. To finance, sustainable finance is the, is the future. The European Commission is working, working on it. Uh, so sustainable finance is a, a way to integrate uh, environmental and social aspect considerations into um, investment decisions. Customer centricity, this is, uh, uh, I would say, obvious. Uh, use your experience, put your customer uh, and build your business around. Digital transformation, the platformization, as uh, we have seen before with, uh, with Ricardo. The blockchain as a technology from uh, financial application to logistics. So the new application of innovation to, to the business coming from this side. Data science. Uh, artificial intelligence and uh, robotic process automation. These are tools for business decision. These are not just tools for uh, nerds, people, math. They are, these are tools which are, um, which are used uh, more and more and more into the, um, into the business decision. And finally, storytelling. You may say, why storytelling? Because uh, even when you talk about regulation, as I am doing, I'm not saying that I'm a good storyteller, but when, for example, when we talk about risk control in our company, we try to build a narrative. Uh, we try to uh, build our, an effective narrative and engage, inspire uh, the audience, because uh, it's important also the way you communicate what you are doing. And this is in a company and uh, as a prospective employee when you are uh, in your interview. Thank you, Rita. Thank you very much uh, for all uh, these um, interesting advice. It's also, um, uh, so it's positive also to see uh, where you see avenues for um, uh, career or development, as you say, and it's true that a career is nothing else in a sense that the continuous learning and development process, and uh, maybe the word development is a nicer one than career. 
So we had a, a bit, um, uh, um, we taken a little bit more time than expected, but this is because uh, our speakers' presentations were all extremely helpful. So I would like to thank you all for being here. Uh, uh, the, you know, sharing your time, uh, giving your time to us. I'm sure the students uh, have appreciated this because uh, the number of people collected has remained quite stable. We have more than 40 uh, people. So uh, thank you all again uh, uh, very much for your time. And uh, um, maybe if you could uh, uh, send the slides, your presentation to Federica, then if the students want to um, see them, we can uh, circulate uh, the, the slides. Uh, uh, so I'm, now it's time for to say bye bye. I really hope to see you all uh, very soon on some other occasions, but thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. And thanks to Federica Corrente for helping us with the organization of this seminar. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Federica.